Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Breaking Point Podcast UK. Today we're here, today we are here with Paul Gilmartin, who is a stand-up comedian and host of the Mental Illness Happy Hour podcast. That's right, isn't it? Yep. Perfect. And Paul is be an awkward start. Yeah, that would be an awkward start. Yeah, exactly. I just got a double check. Is it Jill Martin or Gil Martin? Gil Martin. Gil Martin. And, I, and I've butchered other people's credits introducing them on my podcast, so uh, you you would be in good company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And speaking of, yeah, we are with a podcast veteran today, people. Um, we had, we got in contact through Pilar Alessandra, who is who was on the show a few weeks ago, and she was like, you got to speak to Paul. And I read up on you and I'm really looking forward to speaking with you. So thank you so much for being here at whatever time it is. In Are you in LA, California? Uh, I am. I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what could you talk uh, with Pilar about? We spoke about the why we love stories and sort of narrative and... It was less mental health based, um, but I we sort of I tried to link in like because I'm a big believer that like narrative and story, the way we see the world is through that, and therefore there is an aspect of mental health in that. There's an overlap there, and and yeah, Pilar's a, a well, the wife of a really good friend of of mine, but uh, yeah, I mean a heavy. Heavy hitter screen screenwriting uh, yeah uh, feature yeah. And... yeah no she was great so Paul let's get into let's start with the cliche I'm sure you've said it a hundred thousand times but we're just going to do it anyway because it's helpful to me and to everyone talk about you know how you ended up a bit of your background to where you are now and then we'll go into more detail as we get through the podcast if that's okay. Uh, I was raised in Chicago, uh, kind of a, a dysfunctional family, nothing overtly dramatic, but, uh, you know, a checked out alcoholic, high functioning dad uh, who hit, hit his alcoholism really well. And a mom who, you know, looked for the nearest, uh, body to fill the void by a husband who wasn't interested in her. So. Yeah. Kind of a, a smothering, smothering figure with no boundaries and her own history of trauma. Um, an older brother. Uh, just from the earliest, some of my earliest memories, I just loved making people laugh and more importantly, being the center of attention. You know, I could play armchair psychiatrist and say, well, you know, you're dad wasn't that interested in you and you know blah 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 um i just remember the high the first time i made my first grade class laugh and i was like what is this new tool uh laughter exactly. and uh and i've always been just drawn to to funny people all my all my best friends have always been people with uh with senses of humor and Fast forward to, well, started started you know with alcohol and drugs. I'm sober 20 years now, but uh, yes, I know that's amazing. Alcohol and drugs became a coping mechanism for me starting around 14, and um, yeah, you know they say that the addict or alcoholic kind of emotionally f- is frozen at the age that they begin getting high or getting drunk escaping and I I, I do believe that because there are many days even though I've been sober 20 years where I still feel like in fact I was talking to my friend on the phone today and I said you know many days I still feel like a frightened 11 year old boy I'm just in an adult's body yeah um but I I thought that um if I could become a famous comedian all my problems would be solved um, but I kind of put that dream on hold, went to college, decided, oh, I'm going to 
do something practical. I'm going to uh, see if I can go to medical school. And I was a really good student. I was, you know, practically a straight A student. And my junior year, I my roommate, who's still my best friend, talked me into joining a campus comedy competition and to overcome my nerves for trying stand up for the first time. Yeah. Uh, I took an acting class and fell in love with that and changed my major from pre med to theater. And yeah, Didn't look uh, when I got out, wasn't getting much acting work and um, started doing stand up. And stand up uh, brought a lot of great things uh, into my life. I did it for, God, probably 25 years. Started doing it in 87 and kind of stopped doing road work in 2012, maybe. In 1995, uh, 94, I moved to Los Angeles with my then girlfriend who later became my wife. We're now divorced. And I auditioned for a TV show in 1995 uh, called Dinner in a Movie. And it's a movie hosting show. I'm sure you guys have those in the UK where, um, you know, one or two people in between the movie and the commercial, you talk about the movie and you do something, you know, make some jokes or whatever. And so oh, no, I, I got ca I got cast in this uh, thing on TBS, uh, the network here in the States, uh, 1995, and it lasted for 16 years. And it's funny. Wow. I never imagined it would go 16 episodes. So it became... Um, Something that helped me not have to be on the road all the time as a stand-up, which was nice. I, you know, got a little bit of notoriety, um, a, you know, a little taste of the fame that I thought was going to solve everything. And whatever little taste of fame I'd have. Uh, and mind you, that we're not talking like red carpet fame, but you know, people yeah. still stop you on the street. Oh, you know, I love your show or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it did nothing. In fact, if anything, it made me more desperate to find something yeah. to bring me peace. Uh, and I realized there was something empty inside of me that was unfillable. And it wasn't until I had to get sober to not die from, you know, killing myself because I was so depressed. It was then that I discovered human connection was what I was looking for. All along, I'd been trying to look impressive, <laughs> never doing an incredible job of it. Yeah. Um, but I thought being impressive was the road to safety and serenity. And it turns out, actually getting in a room with people and getting vulnerable and talking about your failures and your fears, that is what brings me peace. And so that also inspired me to start doing my podcast, The Mental Illness Happy Hour in 2011. Yeah, I started about six months before the TV show went off the air. So it was a kind of a fortuitous overlap. And um you know, you were talk. We were talking about Pilar and the power of stories, and uh, it's power of the stories in my support groups is what inspired me to start the podcast because I felt like there was um, a void in talking about mental health. You know, back then in in 2011, it was either kind of touchy feely, new agey, you know, Mother Earth sandals and robes or it was you know kind of academic and dry and statistics and it was like where you know where's the like the fucked up jokes and the tears and the laughter and the rawness and the uncensored um because that's what i needed when i was at my most depressed you know it it helped me with my alcoholism continues to help me with that but what about people out there that aren't alcoholics or addicts and they're just feeling alone and feel like nobody understands and i thought i think i could be that voice yeah. for them through, via my guests and my conversation 
and so started it in, in 2011 and still doing it. How's that for a long ass answer? Are you still awake? Yeah. Ollie, really. are you there? Yeah. Ollie? No, that's a brilliant answer. Um, yes. And I, I like the bit. Well, there's, there's two, there was two things that I was going to say, but I'll start with the, the one that was most recent. I like the bit where you said how going to, as much as it's unfortunate, going to the support groups was really helpful for you because I always feel like maybe some people or maybe everyone can get trapped in their own sort of echo chamber of life and they can't really, you know, we underestimate the power that being exposed to other people's stories and sensations and feelings how that can impact us and I think if especially if you're a creative person which obviously you are you you have the ability to really take on you have the really you have the ability to really absorb what's going on around you and therefore being exposed to people who can stories and stuff who can almost chink you into slightly better calibration I think that's really interesting and I just thought it was interesting how you said that that was what really helped you um it did yeah. uh, it did and it's the cure for people who are self-absorbed uh, those of us who whose nature uh, is to be self-absorbed um, it it um we think thinking about ourselves more is going to somehow we're going to we're going to come across the solution and yeah. You know, in the years and thousands of support group meetings I've been to, I think that I'm beginning to learn to differentiate between self-reflection and self-obsession. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Therein is where doing, if you want to call it that, doing life right kind of exists for me. But it, I have to make a concerted effort to get out of my own way pick up the phone when I don't feel like it you know when I'm and maybe this is everybody not just addicts but you know when I'm feeling like something's missing from my life um I want to hunker down with yeah. a video game or go into my garage and woodwork it's it's pretty rare that I'm like I want to get together with a group of people um but I so I force my, I mean, I still do, although I've been on video games a, a, uh, a while, but, um, I, you know, I would work and I have healthy hobbies, but I have to force myself to yeah. get out and go to support groups. And, you know, it, it's, it's a non-negotiable for me because I know that my mental health will suffer and I could possibly start drinking and using drugs again. Um, and I also started going to another support group for intimacy issues. You know, it turns out when you're, when you have a creepy mom with no boundaries, it affects your ability to trust women. Um, and that has taken me years to, to unravel. And I, for years was, uh, uh, a creepy dude, an objectifier, a womanizer. Um, I didn't have boundaries. And I saw women as as sex objects, um, and it, it I never understood the relationship between how I viewed women in my in my childhood. But it's it's not an intellectual. Oh, I understand it now. Everything's fine now. There's a lot of going back and dealing with the sadness and the anger and all the the feelings from childhood that we stuffed down because I was the good boy. You know, my brother was the troublemaker, so I was like, I don't want to make things any worse. And my mom also started opening up to me at seven, like I was her therapist, complaining about her marriage and, you know, other stuff. When I hear it myself say it today, I'm like, oh my God, how could you do that to a seven year old or nine year old, however, however old I was? But um, that'll do a number on you, you know, when you're. You know, caregiver of the opposite sex or the gender that you're attracted to, um, is is sick. It's I, 
I don't know many people who right out of the gate, you know, after 18, have a healthy view of uh, the other gender and society. And, yeah. you know, we tend to view, um, we tend to believe that the world views us the way that parent did, that problematic parent. Yeah. Do you know who Carl Jung is? Have you heard of Carl Jung? I do. I do. Yeah. So he was, so, oh, yeah, you know who he is. So he sort of developed the archetypes, and two of them were the anima and the animus. And he believed that the anima was the feminine aspect of a man or the, fam- the feminine aspect of the psyche of a man. And then the animus was the vice versa the uh, masculine aspect of a woman and he believed that the anima was sort of curated as a result of all past all prior relationships with women growing up in life and particularly a boy's mother because they're the, that's the primary female role model they had growing up but it you know it's influenced by every sort of significant female interaction you have and he believed that the anima was effectively the way that we related to the world so it was just interesting the way that you spoke about society and and sort of uh women and you sort of conflated those two things and i just wonder if that was yeah i never really understood what young meant when he said the way we relate to the outer world is in- influenced by our own anima and Yes, you know, anima, men can become anima possessed, which can be incredibly difficult thing that they have to overcome and sort of integrate their own anima. And yeah, I, I, I just, I don't really know where I was going with that, but I just thought that was interesting the way you sort of That's all right. articulated that in a way that um, Jung, Carl Jung, because I love Carl Jung, would relate, would understand so I completely understand what you mean yeah and as we grow up we you know we have to every single one of us has to push beyond the sort of expectations that we have the pre pre pre-expectations that we have constructed of a certain type of people or you know as you said women and, and men and we have to sort of go through the learning curve of suffering that can ensue as a result of our sort of partially sighted expectations and obviously as you said that's something that you had to work through and probably stumble through as well so I I understand that stumbled is definitely a good verb uh, for it crawl stumble yeah Uh, you know for me any any kind of solid purchase I I, I have on uh, you know what an emotional foundation has been extremely hard fought um, and not graceful. Hmm. But I don't know many people who recover from trauma gracefully. Yeah, um, it's. And it's one of the ways it it also presents a tremendous opportunity for us to heal by being compassionate with ourselves as we recover ungracefully to meet ourselves where we're at any opportunity to be compassionate with ourselves you know there People often think to be compassionate towards oneself means that you're, you know, letting go any responsibility or any kind of eye on personal growth that you're just going to be making excuses for yourself. Now you can, you can make a note to self to do better next time and then be compassionate with your, with yourself. Uh, you know, I say all the time, nobody has ever shamed themselves into being the person they want to be. It took me four decades to be able to realize that that's what I had done my whole life and that that was contributing to my intimacy issues. 
Uh, you know, perfectionism is at the heart of fear of intimacy. Um, fear of responsibility and setting boundaries is another thing. Not having the vocabulary to be able to state our needs and to set boundaries in a way that's diplomatic. It, these were all things that I had, you know, my coping tools before I started going to support groups was avoid or explode. And usually avoid would be what I would, you know, I'll give you an example of how bad I was, how afraid I was of confrontation. I caught a workman stealing in my house uh, one day. They were put in a floor and I walked in and this is how long ago it was. He was stealing some of my Led Zeppelin CDs. And I so didn't want to confront him, I pretended that I didn't see him. Wow. Yeah. And at the time... I just remember thinking, you sad little boy, mm. you can't even speak up for yourself. But I, I didn't know what the words, I didn't, I didn't want him to be embarrassed. I didn't know what to say. I, you know, today I know what I would do. I would say, get your shit, get out of my house. Um, I'm calling your boss give me my cds i don't know where i'll pl i'll play them because i don't have a cd player but yeah. um it took me years to be able to even feel that i deserve to not be stolen from it sounds so ridiculous saying it out loud but it's not an intellectual thing it's a um Self-care is a struggle for people who've experienced um, childhood trauma, especially of a, of a sexual nature. Um, it really, it leaves an imprint on you that, that you are um, less than. Yeah. And there's just becomes this um, struggle to make it a doctor's appointment. You know, to floss your teeth, <laughs> to make an appointment for the dentist, yeah. to shower, especially when you're when you're depressed. So those are all things that I've gotten better at as I've healed that that trauma. Yeah, I think one of the the worst things about the tragedy of sort of our capacity for anxiety and fear and dread is that over a period of time we start to group it becomes a huge sort of I don't know hot air balloon floating over us as opposed to something you know clouding clouding us as opposed to something that is specific so I always think that someone who has an anxious mind if they're not careful, things will start to conjoin together and what you're afraid of will grow. And you as and what you have to kind of do is continuously push on your comfort zone a little bit because otherwise the alternative will happen and it will push back on you and it will restrict you. And, and that's how people become, you know, agoraphobic. What, what you said earlier about, and, you know, you're completely right because I've had a, a very different great difficulties with anxiety and stuff growing up in my childhood and I completely understand that when you have those feelings and that desire to shut yourself away that's exactly when you need to do the opposite and that's the sort of tragedy about anxiety is that it almost immediately puts up a wall that you then have to climb over or maybe that's the wrong terminology maybe that's what you have to do to start off with but eventually you can mm -hmm. the wall becomes less solid you can walk through it i don't know how to conceptualize it but one of the things that that i learned was that i had been using really broad strokes in um kind of having my walls up having your walls up is not always a bad thing no exactly um 
I was putting my walls up for everybody. And what I've learned to do, and I'm still learning, is to choose who to let my walls down around, when and where. And and there's an art uh, to that because sometimes I befriend people that wind up not being trustworthy. Not often, but you know, every once in a while. So uh, I think a lot of us, the older we get, we do get a little better at um, judging people's characters and, you know, or at least, um, waiting a bit before we tell them our entire life story. Uh, but yeah, walls, uh, knowing when to, to let your walls down. And that's why I love support groups so much is because, um, the format of it is that, you know, each person sharing it's kind of a controlled conversation. And so you can get to know somebody from their three minute share and they can get to know you. You're not going out for a two hour dinner with them where it's like, oh, 15 minutes in, I don't like this person. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of you get to test the waters and decide who you're going to let into your life a little bit more. Yeah. It's so it's interesting that you brought up I mean I brought up the wall sinks but when that guy that was stealing from you you you'd think that you'd put walls up there or, or obviously you you must have put maybe you put walls up around you there as opposed to because I can completely understand that if you've grown up with parents that made you feel like you didn't have a say or like you couldn't you know almost in an authoritarian state type I'm not saying this was the case, but um, something where you felt you had to constantly placate and pander and appease people, then endeavouring to be confrontational, even when it's necessary, is obviously going to be an incredibly difficult thing for you to do as you get older. So, yeah, you know, you you had your walls up, but also you had your walls down, maybe in the wrong maybe yeah yeah they were back my walls were backwards yes yeah uh i would i would love and maybe they are teaching this in school but i would love for kids starting in first grade to learn how to identify their needs and ask for them mm -hmm. uh, you know you look at almost any, any person who is poorly behaved um some need of theirs, some healthy right-sized need of theirs is not being met. Yeah. And you could say, well, what about a spoiled child that's been, you know, that's given everything they want? Yeah, the, the need that's not being met is boundaries yeah. and consequences Separation. and discipline. So a short of you where uh, you've already brushed on that. You, you touched on this actually already where you said with this this woman, you were saying that the reason you got into comedy was to look for love. What do you, if you believe in hindsight, what do you mean by that? Do you think? Well, to me, um, to the love that I was looking for was a love that I can control, which then really obliterate what love is because love the very nature of love usually involves some type of reciprocity and vulnerability and uh, kindness i wanted to be adored mm. you know i wanted to be impressive that's that's the kind of love that i was looking for because i didn't know what healthy love looked like because I didn't know what vulnerability looked like. So it was really in support groups and processing trauma that I began to understand vulnerability and how awesome it is. Yeah. They uh, end up everything. Yeah. Yes, I can imagine vulnerability is is the key, and that's displayed in a lot of movies and stuff that I always think is interesting. Uh, the vulnerability is what draws uh, draws people together and builds relationships, which is sort of counterintuitive. But I suppose it's not. But it, it, and I think it it 
and I think it's it's um, sorely needed in the public sphere. Uh, Definitely, yeah. To be modeled by men, it, I wish everybody could see could see the Thursday night support group. It's a, it's a men's uh, only meeting, and. I mean, we're talking guys that were in prison, guys that were bouncers at, you know, Hell's Angel bars, uh, and we cry. We talk about our fears, um, and after I started going to that meeting, I've been going there 19 years. I was like, "Oh, these are men," mm. you know. Yeah, they have the 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 obvious kind of parts of them that some of them are kind of alpha and so, you know some of them aren't but more than anything they unapologetically get vulnerable and they talk about their feelings and I don't know I, I I've heard so many women in my support groups especially when they're new to them after a man shares something vulnerable say you're the first man I've ever seen sound safe or talk about his feelings or, or be vulnerable. I didn't know men had those kinds of feelings. Mm. And I think all men have probably the same five feelings. We just have different ways of expressing them. You know, we want love. Well, some one person might ask for it in a right sized way, and another person might explode at somebody because they're afraid they're not getting it or they're unworthy of it. Yeah. I think is inter- I'm glad that you bring up the whole sort of the men aspect of mental health because obviously there's a you know, men's mental health pandemic and epidemic, especially I'm well, not actually in the West, everywhere in the world at the moment. And, you know, obviously I'm relatively new to the world, so I don't really know what things were like in the past, but it's, you know, I, I talk to people a lot and they, I ask people that question a lot and I go, why do you think this is going on with men and stuff and, you know, mental health experts and they say, well, you know, COVID was pretty bad and, you know, the, 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 the pandemic, the uh, lockdowns and I, I think, I mean, there's an element of that, but I think the biggest reason why men are struggling nowadays is because we've allowed false narratives of sort of toxic masculinity and oppressive patriarchy to seep into the mainstream, and they're incredible. Percent. Look, look at the top ten movies, and you will find your answer. What do you mean by that? Look at look at action movies. Okay. And I understand they're there for entertainment. They're, you know, everything doesn't need to be a lesson, but the predominance of them. And I'm guilty. You know, I watched Equalizer 1 and Equalizer 3 and enjoyed them. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, we just need, it's not like we need to get rid of those. We need stuff in addition. Mm to those but that's really the role of a father isn't it yeah to model that it's not the role of hollywood producers no exactly yeah as in you mean it's the role of a father and a mother, who, and a mother. yeah I was, I was i was gonna say i wouldn't maybe it's a the, the, the father especially you know to to say hey you know here's how i went about becoming a man yeah. Uh, even if he doesn't say it to his child to model it. Yeah. Because you can no. talk at your kids probably all, all you want, but yeah, definitely. your actions, your kids watch your actions probably more than they listen to your words. They absolutely do. Yeah, they have an incredible ability to, to mimic, to sort of distill and then mimic appropriately. Just one thing I wanted to say, because I think it might be interesting to get your opinion I have this idea of like childhood as you walking down a path. You said earlier how you feel like parts of 
us can get stuck in a moment or a period of time where maybe we experienced a traumatic incident and I imagine you're walking down a path and then you know a huge boulder blocks you but then you have to keep moving forward but maybe a part of you is trapped behind that boulder and and then you know maybe something gets in the way or you have to duck or either way you're sort of there's a litany of many sort of yous was a weird term stuck along this path and you know and and that's what can cause it's when you get to adulthood or whenever you're not you don't feel whole which is maybe why people go looking for feelings of you know attention and things like that and part of going part of maybe healing trauma or overcoming trauma is to sort of conceptually go back and I said to a therapist to move the boulders out of the way and she said no to implement skills to jump over the boulder or to it's not necessarily about maybe it's not about bringing you all together as such it's more about giving yourself tools that you can learn in the present that may be able to help the past versions of you overcome what it is that they so that you don't feel oh I'm that 11 year old boy that was stuck there anymore because you know when that guy broke when that guy was stealing from you your unconscious mind would have gone back to you know 10 year old Paul and went can't say anything here just gonna have to let this guy go and I really want to say something but I can't and I always feel like maybe overcoming a lot of trauma is understanding that you're no longer that child that small child that that thing happened to you're now a fully grown man and you know you're 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 a strong intelligent man in your case and you can that was a very convoluted but do you do you kind of get what i mean with the aspect i do yes that all makes that all makes sense to me and and i do like the analogy that we leave parts of our, our parts of ourselves get get left behind and you know to reintegrate uh, to feel whole yeah we 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 it's all about coping strategies it's all about tools and sometimes that tool is talking about it crying you know whatever but for me on a lot of days it's picking up the phone it's meditating you know maybe it's prayer i'm not a religious person but you know i find uh prayer to just talk into the universe Um, i don't know i find it i find it helpful Uh, i find it humbling to remind myself that i'm not in charge Uh, exercise trying to eat right apologizing when i'm wrong trying to be helpful Uh, these are all coping mechanisms that i have to employ if i have a if i'm going to have a shot i have to take my meds um and yeah yeah no exactly i always say if you're struggling in life just take it back to the basics of what you're doing every day and build up from there because we tend to look at the bigger picture and catastrophize and if we can just focus on the small i i I have a degree in catastrophizing i have a phd in catastrophizing yeah yeah, so that's a lot of catastrophizing. Yeah, I'm, I've, I've got a bit of history of that as well. To be fair, um, that's another thing I wanted to talk about. So, I'm a, a huge, you know, the film Inside Out, the the Pixar film. Is it Pixar? It's a Disney film. But do you, have you heard of the film Inside Out? I have not seen it. Okay, so you should watch it. That's that's your homework after today. Um, basically, it's okay. about this teenage girl and. It's an animation and she's got these five little emotions that sit in her head and then it's like they're sitting at a watching a big screen in an office um and the screen is what she sees and it's about how a good i completely agree with this a good way and you know psychologists and i think even mythology is is really if you want to understand the human condition read mythology is my opinion is what our brain is made up of many 
sub personalities that all want to grab hold of the reins at certain points and there's they have like an inner an inner battle between them sometimes and that's what happens in this film like there's there's the five main emotions are happy are joy sadness disgust anger and fear and you know joy is sort of trying you know joy's doing what joy's doing but sadness is always trying to seep in and sort of uh sneak her way in around to grab control and they're like what's happening and then you know sadness is anyway i i think that that's such a good way to conceptualize yourself as having not like in a split personality sort of way but as in like we're not we're made up of many you know many gods so to speak which is why the gods used to say um you know we're you know you we're um what's the word we've been taken control of by the god of rage or whatever you know as opposed to oh there's chemicals going on in your brain which means you're angry no a better way of putting it really is the god of rage is controlling you at the moment in a phenomenological sense so in, in one of this but go yeah. ahead no 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 you go ahead i've spoken enough there uh, I, I was just going to say one of the things that I learned in therapy was um, that we can hold two seemingly contradictory emotions at the same time. Yeah. Um, and the yeah, fucking know. Germans have all kinds of words for things that we never even knew existed. Didn't you know? like it. Um, but yeah, it, it um, I, I do agree that the, the, certain emotions um just kind of want to want to come out and i used to try to change what it was that i was feeling rather than being curious about it have you ever read the book on new earth by eckhart tolle no but i've read his other book i'm not sure what it's called power but now. I read the power of now yes i've read the power of now yeah um Read a new earth. Okay. It, 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 I read the power of now. Now I liked it, but um, a new earth is, to me is, is one of the most profound books I've ever read, and it's about all the things that we're talking about, the way the mind works, and how to step back from the mind and to identify. Um, it's very kind of when Buddhist, it's... but I, it's also very practical and it's really dense. It's like you don't want to read more than like two paragraphs a day because you'll read one of the paragraphs and you'd be like, I have to go sit under a tree and stare at the clouds while I think for the next yeah. four hours. Is it to be it's like one of those one of those books. Okay. Yeah, but yeah New Earth. That really helped me um, not identify my thoughts or my feelings as me. Yeah. No, I think that is... rather th- to, yeah, that is that is so. Key. Sometimes I just look at my brain like an animation festival that I've been trapped in. You know, uh, just like, ah, well, let's enjoy these crazy thoughts. Let's yeah. be amused by the catastrophizing rather than being like, well, oh, you know, why shouldn't be this way? You know, be it, be curious about it, be amused by it. Yeah, know? and so much of it is just taking ourselves less seriously. Yeah. Definitely, which is probably another reason why you fell in, fell into comedy, and you know I imagine you're good at self-deprecating humor as well, which is a vital part of being a good comedian. Um, I've gotten better at it, but it used to be that it was a way for me to let my hostility out, and I couldn't see it. You know, I couldn't see it. Okay, yeah, that, that's I made point. people. Um, no, not really passive, just kind of in a, you know, I always thought that like, if it's funny, it doesn't matter how hard it bites. Okay. Yeah. That's what you mean. Okay. So, and I don't feel that way today, but every once in a while, you know, I'll say something, you know, because the, or the comedian in me, if I think of something that's really funny, it's like. I want some accolades for this great thing I just thought of, but you know, sometimes I'd be like, "Yeah, that's that would be kind of dickish to say out loud." But yeah, yeah, something fucked up and tragic and sad happens. My the first place my brain goes to is writing a joke about it. Yes, see, 
there's I find that I was thinking about that the the other day actually there's you know there's a societal dilemma and argument going on around comedy and I'm not sure it's probably been going on well it's certainly gotten a lot worse 